Welcome to A Breath of Fresh Career. Justin Kane, the host here, uh, season two, episode eight already. I'm joined here by what I would consider a dear friend in the industry, Udayan Bose. Um, before I even get into an intro on Udayan, th this is probably the, the nicest guy um, at the intersect between our, uh, 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 ad tech and value tech in the industry. I mean, he is just such a great guy. I see him at trade shows. Um, always greets me with a huge smile and a hello. So I'm so happy to have you here, Yudan. Thank you. The privilege on. is all mine, Justin. That was, I am blushing. That was a rather <laughs> too kind of an introduction. So thank well, you. that's not even the intro. Yudan is the CEO of a company by the name of Net Elixir. Net Elixir is down, located down in the Princeton, New, G New Jersey area. They are a global search marketing agency dedicated to helping retailers find and acquire new cu uh, customers online. He's a father. He's a husband. He's a super fun spirited guy, as I already said, and he works with his wife. I mean, you have to be a great guy to be able to do that. You know, <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, why don't can, can you just tell the listeners um, who you are? Like, you know, talk to us about Uday and Bose and then we'll get into Net Elixir. Well, Uday and Bose is uh, first of all, I, I think just very blessed to be where we are today, uh, Justin, because when we started the company, me and my wife, uh, way back, 17 years back, out of a small apartment in India, I never ever thought I will sort of have the privilege of doing a, 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 a this this podcast or this this is a session with Justin King. So I am absolutely <laughs> honored and privileged. It's like 17 years of an interesting and a wild ride. So uh, what we do at Netflix, we are a digital marketing firm. We started with as a search marketing company. And now we uh, really have become more of a growth marketing company. So growth marketing in the sense we build e-commerce sites and then we drive traffic to the website through all the different channels, which is, whether it is be Google ads, uh, Facebook ads, Amazon, programmatic display, et cetera, et cetera, everything. And then at the end of it, there is a big analytics component as well. So we are, we are known in the industry to be fanatically analytical. So we try And uh, that's what that's what essentially the, the company is. We are one of the one of the top ten independent North America, and something again. Uh, I uh, honestly speaking, I'm very privileged to be a part of an exceptional bunch of people who are really proud to call themselves Netflix here. So very very privileged to have one of the most diverse teams in the entire industry. And just be very thankful to them. I mean, uh, so Uday Bose is a learner. Uh, he's a very proud dad and a husband. <laughs> and uh, he is really blessed to get an opportunity to work with a wide range of and very diverse uh, people who is very proud to call uh, the Netflix experience or team members. That's awesome. And by the way, you know, you started uh, Net Elixir out of a small apartment in India. You and I were speaking briefly before we kicked this off. Prayers, prayers to uh, friends, family, coworkers, colleagues in uh, in India with what's going on right right now with uh, COVID. Thank um, you, thank you, Justin. Yeah, it's uh, it's pretty sad. It's pretty scary. And and one of the things you left out is that you're a CEO. Um, and you're the CEO at Net Elixir. So, so tell us about the role you play as CEO in, in the day in the life, if you can, please. Well, I mean, uh, first of all, I really wanted to clarify the, this, this, this title of CEO. Uh, for me, the CEO is more of a chief enablement officer. So E stands for enablement. I think so. I uh, pretty much, I think the first part, which I'm extremely, extremely proud of and which I think uh, I spend a lot of time doing is really enabling enabling a lot of our customers and really on their path to path to e-commerce success. That's, I think, something which makes us extremely proud. The second part is basically an enablement of a lot of people who trust in the company and who join us to be Netflix Syrians or team members and really just sort of helping them achieve what their true potential is. So all that I'm doing is probably, it's almost like a cup of tea, Justin. I mean, uh, it's almost like hot water, right? Unless and until you soak a tea bag and the tea bag really imparts color to the entire water, you never know. So what we are trying to do is provide an environment where people can really uh, be themselves and uh, be, uh, be true to their potential. Because one of the observations which I, I, I'm really, very, very passionate about and very focused on, uh, it's my belief and working in some of the organizations prior to starting Netflix, 
that many of the people never get an opportunity to show their true potential. And I hope we have been able to build that culture in NetLexer, whereby people are able to exhibit and demonstrate their true potential. So the CEO for me is more of a chief enablement, whether it is enabling customers towards their success or growth path, or enabling people to realize their true potential, which they should anyway. Your team, yeah, that's, that's great. Um... My experience with you is that's very true um, because every every time we've met, I could tell that you're trying to, you know, enable people to be their best uh, at whatever they're doing. So so that's that's great. What so apartment in India, Net Elixir, 17 years ago. How'd you get your start? So I was interested. I, I was actually uh, a, a part of a very interesting startup, Justin, which was started by two of my uh, engineering schoolmates in India. Uh, they started an online gaming company, an online gaming or gambling company, let us say. Now, understandably, I was a little surprised and extremely reluctant to join them in 2001 because online gaming is very clearly frowned upon. And uh, I sort of joined it because I didn't know anything about online. So nothing. I, my, my only interaction before joining that gaming, uh, the gaming company was I used to check my hotmail about twice a month. That's pretty much, I think, what it was. And I, I thought it was an interesting challenge. And I just wanted to check if I am, I was really up for it. So I was, I started the bingo business for the, for the company and was there for about two years, was also leading their marketing function as well for a, a fair amount of time within this time as well. Amazing. And uh, while working at that company, by the way, the, the company did exceptionally well, Justin. Uh, we actually became the world's largest uh, online gaming company. Uh, I left the company in 2003, December to start Netflix in any way, but the company in 2005 did a, a 10 billion pound IPO. So we were bigger than Google and British Airways combined and we were the largest awesome. company in the world. So I mean, yeah, I, I played a very small role uh, in its initial years, pre-IPO. But uh, yeah, it, 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 it was fascinating. I sort of moved on to the, it, it was like, like any entrepreneur, you really have to uh, have to believe your hunch and just sort of jump into something. So, I mean, I must say gaming was something that I was not very comfortable with. I was, I'm a, a lot more of an academic guy rather than a gaming guy. <laughs> so I, I, I preferred to move into slightly, slightly more ethical line of business, if I may, uh, which was, which was essentially search advertising. And this was, Google has still not done the IPO. And this was like way back. And I just took a bet that why should anyone click on any of the ads no one can force Justin or no one can force anyone to click on any, any of the Google ads, right? So if people are clicking on the ads, it has to be voluntary. I really want to click on an ad, that's the reason I'm clicking on an ad. And if an advertising model is successful and it can be really built on that, uh, I think it is worth taking a shot that uh, uh, this, 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 this form of advertising would grow. And uh, we also had experience firsthand at party gaming. That, uh, that, that, that this entire thing works as well. We are able to drive profitable revenues. So that's the reason we sort of jumped in, took a plunge. And uh, so far we have not had a chance to complain because uh, I'm pretty sure everyone is aware of Google success, if not anything else. But yes. uh, yeah, so we got lucky with the time. So, so you were working for this online gaming company and you recognize, did you recognize there was a need for search advertising improvement? We used at that to time? do search advertising, Justin. So we were actually one of the top 10, uh, uh, let us say, advertisers for uh, Overture used to be there back those back, back in those days, the pay-per-click advertising, the pioneers. Uh, then Overture got acquired by Yahoo. So this was, we, we were actually one of the top 10 advertisers for them worldwide in terms of ad, ad budgets. So I knew that it worked. This form of advertising worked and I just took a plunge, yeah. Wow, that, that's, it's great. What, um, What's one thing you, you would wish you had known before you began your career? Well, I mean, one thing which I, I'm, I'm probably a little biased here, Justin, just because how we have built the company. So when I started on my own, see, I mean, party gaming, I was, I was one of the co-founders. I was not really a founder founder. So I didn't know as much and money was with the, not- With the gaming good. company? With the gaming company. Yes, okay, yeah. yep. So I was a part of the founding team, which was a, a bigger founding team. But in this case, I was the- so-called the, the one of the two co-founders along with my wife, right? So uh, a lot of people told me back then that uh, it's impossible to start a company unless and until you, you raise venture capital funds and uh, or angel investment funds and so on, right? So, so it's, impo 
it's impossible to start a, a, an organization, a technology company without, without investment, without an investor. I mean, I think the first of all, you really need to be focused on building as to a product which delivers value. So I, I believe that at that point in time, if someone had really focused, told us that just sort of focus on as to what you do and really try to build the value and then really prove that there is a market for that before really trying to really diversify and divert your time and spending time in terms of raising funds and so on. So I think that was one of the advice pieces that I, I, I would really give to anyone. First, prove out the concept, build this minimum viable product. And if you, you can have people pay for that, that means there is some value. And only after that, jump into venture capital funding. Uh, that was, I think, one. The second part, I think, which we have got to learn over the years, uh, there, there was, I mean, again, this I'm talking about 2004, five, right? When, when uh, uh, making money or running a profitable digital company was frowned upon almost, right? You shouldn't make money. You just sort of keep spending and they sort of grow big fast. That was, I think, the thing. So I have learned very clearly that profit is a great word. And I think every entrepreneur and everyone who starts a business should be obsessively focused on profit along with obviously growth. So that was, I think, those, those are the two things. Again, that's pretty much the model that we run. It's a slightly different model. Uh, we have been cash flow positive. We have been profitable since 2009. And that really has helped us tremendously to do a lot of things. It has given us a lot of freedom to do a lot of things. Yeah. That's amazing. So in the, in the spirit of a breath of fresh career, you know, I put this together. I, I'll tell you a quick story because you and I haven't yeah. had this conversation, but um, the pandemic hit here in North America. Uh, I, I, it was like a little, it was about this time last year, right. Where, yeah. um, where it really started to, you know, influence hiring and, uh, companies and organizational structure and everything. And, and people were getting laid off and people were looking mm -hmm. for jobs. And, mm -hmm. uh, I went up to the house one Friday evening and, uh, my wife had met me on the, on the back deck with a, a glass of wine. Cause it was a beautiful day, like today, sunny, mm -hmm. warm. And, um, I was completely fried, you did. I was completely mentally and physically exhausted because of the number of outreach that had happened, right? I, I couldn't talk to enough people a day. Can you help this person? Can you help that person? We just had to let go of 25% of our, of our organization, you know, this, that, you know, um, you know, my father got laid off. He doesn't know what he's going to like crazy stuff, crazy yeah. stuff. And, um, and some of the listeners have heard this, but uh, my, my son, who's now 13, he was 12 at the time, said, Dad, why don't you start a podcast and you can help everyone? Mm -hmm. That's where a breath of fresh career mm -hmm. came, came in. And I got a little marketer on my hands. He, um, he started to send me uh, links like, you know, podcast 101 for dummies and, you know, uh, the 10 steps you need to take to starting a podcast. And the next morning, Saturday or Sunday morning, I can't remember, we sat down and started to put this all together. He actually came up with the, the, the title of Breath of Fresh Career. Hmm. So my question is, is, is interesting as it relates to that, you know, because we're talking to entrepreneurs, we're, we're, you know, we have people that are listening that are, that are in business that, you know, are looking to make a change, could be interested in making a change, uh, looking for change. I think I said that, um, maybe even starting their own thing, but what advice would you give somebody wanting to pursue a career like yours or a career in, in, in search advertising? Well, I think, first of all, I think Justin, a, 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 a huge thank you for starting the podcast, because I think, uh, I mean, uh, I, I have sort of watched quite a few episodes that you have done and it's like remarkably refreshing. Let me, let me just put it that way. So I think that the amount of freshness, so that also, I think I really wanted to add in from, from your podcast as well. Now, in, in terms of, uh, Effectively, I think the career advice, I don't know whether I have really had a planned career. So I, I probably would be lying if I said I can get advice, but I can probably share some of the learnings that I have had uh, on the way and so, which probably has helped me quite a bit. I, I think the first part in terms of someone who's interested in pursuing a career in digital marketing or wanting to sort of make a switch, uh, I think the first part, I think, which is becoming extremely important uh, may sound very, very basic but have a growth mindset uh, i have seen so many people over the last 17 years justin uh, who had tremendous potential they were extremely smart they were extremely knowledgeable but they just did not have the growth mindset and as a result of which they were unable to evolve with time and uh, i know carol bards of stanford wrote this fantastic book called mindsets i'm a huge fan 
uh, uh, of that book. But I think that that growth mindset, unless and until you just are open to the possibilities, open to the opportunities. I mean, there, there is no way that you'll be able to grow in this space. See, unlike if you look at 1980s or even 90s, your your career was based on, let us say you were working for a uh, an auto company. I can't even mention auto company with Tesla, all the disruption that they are doing. But anyway, back in 1990s or 1980s, it was a, a an auto company and the overall ground on which you were standing was not constantly shifting or moving. But the ground that you are standing on now is shifting constantly. When I started off, there was... Facebook had started pretty much at that time. So there was no Facebook advertising. There was no Twitter. There was no Snap, of course. I mean, there was no, nothing. And LinkedIn was just at that point in time, an easy, uh, very basic networking channel. Yeah. If you remember, there used to be a networking site called Rise, R-Y-Z-E, way back in 2003, 2004. Uh, Amazon still was pretty much an online retailer, not a marketplace. So and if you really look at those times, and if you really look at now, I think a big, big thing that I've been very fortunate, very lucky to really be witnessing is how exactly the market really has evolved. And there are three key themes or core themes that I have been able to identify. The first core theme is the technological shifts happen and they follow an almost like a J curve or almost like an exponential curve, right? So for example, if you remember, I mean, while Facebook was there, MySpace used to be much bigger than that way back. Yeah. Right? Talking about this thing, right? Where is MySpace now? So Facebook, they sort of reached, reached a tipping point and after that, that sort of kept growing. If you really look at Amazon, there were multiple companies like Barnes & Noble actually laughed at Amazon, right? Why should we buy you and all this stuff? So where was Netflix at that time? So always be mindful of the disruptive power of the technologies because before you know it, it goes to a different level altogether. So that's, I think, the first theme which I have been I, I would definitely want to share. The second thing that I really want to share is, I think it's extremely important for anyone, anyone in the professional life who really wants to pursue a career in digital marketing to really spend at least one hour every day just being acquainted or studying or reading or learning or listening to the videos, podcasts of what is going around in the technology world. There are a lot of technologies which are coming in, right? I mean, there is, there is obviously a massive impact that AI is having. And AI that we know today, Justin, is going to be knowing very, very different from AI, which would happen probably in about three, four, five years. AI today is nothing more than a prediction machine, right? There is a certain prediction that they are doing. But mm -hmm. then with the overall capabilities it is developing and the speed at which it is developing, AI may very well replicate a human being, maybe in a span of about five years, a lot more accurately, right? So from that perspective, I think just being aware of all the technologies and just spending some time thinking as to how it may really impact your professional career, how it may it's sort of actually impacting the overall economy and the careers, I think is the second theme. And the third and most importantly may, may, seem, uh, may seem a very, very, very basic and rather uh, almost this thing, uh, never ever stop testing new technologies. So it is not just okay to know that this is great on AI, right? Wherever you get an opportunity, run some experiments and do test it out, right? Only then can you really get, it's almost like getting your hands dirty, right? I mean, mm -hmm. if you don't really make any calls as a salesperson, I can guarantee you will never be a good salesperson. If you want to go into marketing, you really have to get your hands dirty in sales first before you move to marketing. So those are all yeah. sort of have been practices from the same thing. If you don't really know how to really tap into the power of AI, have not really experimented or tested, there is no way for you to really figure out. So those are the three themes I would really want people to really be mindful of and have a growth mindset because there, there would be a very clear segregation or a separation which would happen, Justin, in my opinion. Yeah, and it will even accelerate even further. About 20% of the people will be able to ride the wave and their careers will go to a different orbit altogether. I'm talking yeah. about a different orbital change 80% unfortunately will struggle and they will go down as quickly, right? Because the AI world does not really uh, have that much of a patience, let us say, to wait for you to really keep catching up slowly and slowly. Either you are on the bus or you're not. Or you're waiting There's for no it. No mid path. That's it. Yeah. So that's what my thought would be. Uh, my request is have the growth mindset so that you are in this 20% and you are on the bus. 
I'm taking notes because uh, I love I love to put some comments in and either you're on the bus or you're not. I love that. Um, let me write that down. So when you got your start over in India, you know, you've come up in, in, in the industry. You worked for a major gaming company, which was larger than Google. Uh, I, by the way, I always say that Amazon was really the one that could, they figured out how to make, make a profit on books. Yeah. You know, and then, and then, oh, we can sell LG televisions and make three, what, <laughs> let's start doing, you know, and, and, you know, we can sell bicycles and right. hoses and whatever the heck you need to, you need to buy. Uh, it's pretty incredible. There have to have been some influential people in your, in your career, in your life. Who, who, who are probably the, the three most influential people, people that you think about often? There have been many, actually, Justin. So it's very difficult to pinpoint specific. Obviously, my parents have had a massive, massive impact on my career and they never stopped me from dreaming and they always encouraged me to dream. So I'm really forever grateful to them. Every single person I mention or talk to mentions their parents. And I feel bad. My mother, uh, she looks like she just dropped off a loaf of bread or something. She was just at the door. And uh, I don't know if you saw me look over there, but I'm like, no, no, no. Uh, I sh probably should have invited her in, but uh, it would have been a little weird. It would have been hectic because she she wouldn't have really known what I was doing. Um, but anyway, parents. OK, first one. So that's, I think, obviously, I think first and foremost. The second is very interesting. And sometimes when you uh, go back, it's it, it, I, I was actually sort of thinking as to who all made a big difference. So I, I studied in uh, uh, a school. Uh, it was basically a Catholic school uh, in India uh, called the St. Xavier's, or here we call it Xavier, we call it Xavier, essentially. Yes, so St. Yeah. Xavier's school in, uh, in uh, Jaipur in India. And uh, we had an English teacher who really had a very profound impact. So he was, we used to call him Father Wills Walker. He was an American gentleman who had really, his, his found his sort of life's work in, in Jaipur. And I still sort of choke up a little bit thinking about him because he's, he's very, very special. So this gentleman, he was at the age of 82 and he used to uh, ride a bicycle uh, every, every day for about 10 miles going to slums and doing sort of work for people who were underprivileged. And every weekend was spent actually in a leprosy camp. So I visited the leprosy camp a couple of times as well. And I just sort of asked him, uh, asked him one day, I mean, I, I was very close to him. I, mean, I, I think sort of he liked me as well quite a bit, but I think, so he had a massive impact. I said, Father, what really drives you? Uh, so his answer was very simple. Uh, I, he said that what drives me essentially is, is that glimmer of hope in the people's eyes that I am able to touch. Oh my God. So there are so many people in the world and right, I mean, we are very privileged to be a part of that group, maybe, maybe, maybe what, 10 million, 20 million, 100 million people, uh, Justin, that, we, I mean, we, we both are extremely lucky and privileged, right, to be in that, whatever, 100 million people in the world. But there is still about 7 billion people who are not really as privileged as us. How many times have we stopped and really bothered about that? Can I, can I really touch someone in a way that I'm able to see that glimmer of hope, that, 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 that unbridled joy in their eyes? So that was, I think, something that I always sort of, he had a massive impact on me, massive, massive impact on me. Uh, so, amazing. I mean, that's what my parents and father Bill Spoker, I'll especially call out. There are a lot of other, we have some amazing advisors. Mark Kirshner in the US, he has been, he, has, he was CFO of a business unit at Bayer. He has had a tremendous impact. We have had Mr. Ramanathan. He started pretty much the, the, the high-tech city in Hyderabad and so on. But I really wanted to call out specifically my parents and father Bill Spoker. That's uh, amazing. So, and I appreciate you sharing that and that story. What, you know, going back to a breath, a fresh career, um, you know, one of the other things we do is try to help people during an interview process. And mm -hmm. gone are the days where you can just have a resume and send it in, right? It's the proverbial black hole. Nobody, nobody, you know, nobody even responds to those things. But, you know, let's talk about some of the key characteristics you look for when you're in interviewing care, can candidates. What, how can somebody stand out to you? So I think the first key characteristics is a little probably, uh, I don't know, counter. I really want to understand if before applying for a job, you have really carefully studied, understood, done background research. Because while you are looking for a job, right, I am looking for the right candidate as well. So if you have done the research about me, you should be sort of doing the research about me. Because rather than 
going for a job interview, think of that the company wants you and why should the company want? Is there a fit? So I think if there is a prior research done by the candidates that do I really even want to work there? That's the first part, which is I think extremely important. In many cases, probably, and you sort of know it much better than uh, sort of me, 90% of the people don't think about it, right? They just say that, let me apply for this job, let me apply for this job. But that is almost, do not commoditize yourself, mm -hmm. right? Try to do research. Why is this job right for me? Whatever the job be, I mean, all jobs are good, right? Whatever the job be, why, why, why do you think you are really interested in that job? And what makes you suitable for that job? So first, I mean, don't devalue yourself. That's, that's my first sort of a thing. And try to do a bit of a research to find out if that is a job that you really would want to even apply to. That's, I think, the first one. The second one would be, I mean, when we are hiring for people, I look for three things primarily. I mean, obviously, I'll not talk about the integrity and all these parts. I, I, the first part, I really look for as to, uh, has this person really ha has some failures uh, which has really shaped his or her personality, right? And how much can they really recount these failures to me, right? And uh, in many cases, people tend to bluff. I'll be very direct, right? And it's very easy to make out, right? But if someone is really able to explain the failures and most importantly, able to explain as to why they have failed and what why they have failed and what they have learned, I think that to me is precious because I think failures, I really put a lot of, a lot, lot of really emphasis on the failures, probably even more so than the successes. The second part which uh, I have now become almost like convinced that one of the, one of the most important traits in any, any candidate is just the, the, the gratefulness or the thankfulness. Wow. Right? I mean, in many cases I have seen that people sort of come in, I have done this, I have done this, I have done this. But please understand, I mean, even Steve Jobs needed an army to really sort of make him successful. Right, Albert Einstein did an army to make him successful. Who are you? Right. So effectively, from that, be grateful and please never ever forget to thank all these people who have really helped us get there. So I really want people who are more thankful and more grateful, essentially, uh, in how it is. And the last part is, I am really looking for people who have a more holistic and a more, let us say, uh, 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 even view of the entire world. Right? So who are really able to think broader, right? It is not only about you. I want to understand as to how kind you are and what have you really done outside of your work? How many people's lives have you touched, right? And because, I mean, work is just one part. Let us make, not make work everything and because it sort of tends to fill up your our entire lives entirely. I think there is a lot more to you than just the work component. I want to understand as to what do you do outside of work which and what is the impact you have had on the society or the people that you really sort of are in touch with on a regular basis. Amazing. Amazing. That's, that's deep. That's really, really good. And it's value that, that you need to be able to, uh, to bring to an interview for sure. Um, and it's not, to me, it's not just coming right out and saying it. It's, it's, uh, it's kind of like feeling it right. And having the ability to convey that feeling. Um, you, you mentioned LinkedIn earlier and, and how it started off very small, but when, so you get a resume for somebody that, uh, mm -hmm. that is interested in net elixir. Do you look at, what's the first thing you do? Do you look at the resume? Do you look at them on LinkedIn? Do you do both? What's important to you? I do some amount of LinkedIn search. I mean, I'll obviously look at the resume, but more than like resume, I'm interested in LinkedIn. I'm very interested in as to what people are talking about you. Have you gotten recommendations and what exactly are they talking about you? Now, I have been able to also over time figure out as to what are the recommendations that you had asked for and what are the recommendations that people voluntarily have given you. I think it's easy to make out some themes. Uh, and I really want to see as to who are the people that you are following on LinkedIn, right? So it gives me a good sense. If you are following, let us say, uh, Bill and Melinda Gates, that's a different sort of a profile compared to if you are probably following Zuckerberg or Elon Musk. I mean, everyone, I, I really want to understand. I want to also see as to what groups are you a part of as well. Because groups to me is, uh, I think, a good indication as to that you are trying to take an attempt to really be a part of a community to learn the skill sets more. I'm very interested in seeing as to what certifications, et cetera, what people, how exactly are you learning constantly? I and mean, how do you really sort of keep yourself, yeah. yourself uh, in tune with the times almost? So these are the parts. But I think, uh, yeah, I mean, those are some of those, I think, resume and LinkedIn, you can only make out so much. But I think in person, I think those three things that I mentioned is something that I really focus on a lot. 
Now you're the CEO at Net Elixir. How, how large is Net Elixir today? We are, we are pretty small. We have about uh, 37 members now uh, in Princeton. Uh, we have about 100 in India. Okay. And uh, we just recently started an office. We have two, two team members there in Stockholm in Sweden. So this is a wow. European venture we just started in uh, December last year. Yeah. Congratulations. One of, the last, uh, yeah. one of the last hires I made in 2020 was somebody in, in the UK, a sales guy in the yes, UK for yes, a company that was yes, over there. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, um, how, so, so you've got 130 some odd people. Oh, yes. How, yeah. how do you motivate that number of folks? Like as the CEO, what, what are some of the tricks of the trade that you use to motivate your team? That's a great question. Just that I think I must say a lot about on this topic as well. I think the first part, is, and specifically the last 14 months, as you as you know, have been difficult, right? So I think purely the we, we have to set some fundamentals, right? I think the fundamental, the foundation part, I think we have to set up a foundation. So the foundation, the moment anyone comes into Netflix, they join a family. They don't really join a company, right? So I've, again, thought about it a lot. And I know different companies have different philosophy. Netflix, I'm sorry, Netflix uh, does not really have doesn't believe in the family culture. They have a unique culture. But our thing is you are joining the Netflix family. So we welcome you to the family first. And as a part of the family, I think there are about two or three things that we ensure will happen. One is your safety is number one for us. Not only your physical safety, but your psychological safety as well. We don't want you to be constantly anxious and, oh gosh, will I lose my job, etc. Because that is the biggest, biggest drain in productivity. That anyone can have right so we have to ensure that you are comfortable you are settling in and your safety is the number one concern the second part in the family is we really really want want to show that you belong so i think it, as simple as that it's basically caring getting the other team members to meet with you sort of get you feel comfortable now i know virtual it becomes a lot more challenging because people have not been able to meet as frequently so we in fact have been doing something on an ongoing basis just in september last year uh, where the team uh, meets outside in the parking lot. And uh, just, we call it the social collaboration day. Once a month, we have been meeting. We couldn't meet in the in the two winter months, but other than that, we have been meeting pretty much every month. And that really sort of helps people to get it. It's extremely important for you to see that you are a part of, you belong in that team. And the third part, I think, is something which I feel is the most important thing, which uh, which any any person who is working anywhere should be mindful of. Uh, may seem very basic, it's called respect. If you don't feel respected and valued, you should not be working. You should just walk out literally right now. <laughs> and honestly speaking, that is something which we really put a tremendous amount of. So we we have it, uh, we have a set of core values, which I think we, we start the entire induction process with that. And we keep on reinforcing that constantly. And respect is right there at the top, respect for people. So that's, I think, one. And on the second part, the other part is basically, do you really even relate to our mission? Our mission is to help businesses succeed online. And do you really, what do you even think about that mission? What do you do you really feel a connect with the mission? Because if I'm able to find people who are able to, who are very passionate about helping businesses succeed online and helping is an important word, then I'm able to, I have a much higher chance of helping him, helping them find meaning in the work that they do as well. So the purpose or meaningfulness becomes extremely important as well. And we try to really sort of see as to how much of that connect we are able to bring in. So those are the, those are the things I would say that what, uh, what we try to really sort of do uh, effectively to motivate people and then obviously give them the opportunity, give them the freedom. I mean, I mean they, they are thinking, feeling human beings. So yeah. uh, let them let them get an opportunity to really go ahead and uh, really spread their wings and realize their true potential. That's uh, that's great and great insight. You know, earlier on in this podcast, we uh, we spoke a little bit about um, always being mindful of you know the disrupt disruptive power of technology and kind of like how technology can impact your career and what's coming down the pike and all that good stuff. Um, what are you seeing in the industry? Like, you know, what's next? You, you mentioned AI, but what, what are you seeing out there? What, what's going to be next here? Great question. I mean, I wish I, I could forecast as well, but there are yeah. three trends again I'll sort of highlight. One, I see AI becoming a lot, lot smarter. So, so AI, essentially, I think uh, it may not be a bad idea for every professional who's really sort of more forward looking and just 
thinking ahead to just think of a very simple thing that how can or how may AI disrupt the industry that I'm a part of? Because I can guarantee you, and I'm using the word guarantee, that, that AI will be disrupt, disrupting whatever industry you are in, whatever industry you are in. If you are in auto manufacturing, you are, that will be disrupted. It's already getting disrupted by Tesla. Yeah. Right? Whatever it is, it will get disrupted. Uh, for example, uh, I mean, effectively in the recruiting business is getting disrupted, you get disrupted even further. So if you are able to pre-think all of these potential cases, right? And I think then the question is, you are a lot more prepared, at least you know as to what is coming. So that's, I think, the first part. The AI I am extremely bullish about. The second part that I see coming is, is this enormous emergence of social commerce as well as uh, your AR, VR, or extended reality. Just think of it, Justin, how many times uh, when, let us say, uh, uh, we, we go to the malls with our friends, family, or whoever it is, right? I believe, and I am, I believe that in the future, we'll be able to do that virtually. And extended reality, or let us say AR, VR, wow. and social commerce would be a thing, a big thing. Uh, I know, uh, uh, I know it's a, it's a little sort of, a, a little bit of a future talk, but I see it coming. Primarily because at this point in time, if you look at shopping, it's extremely boring online shopping. You have a purpose, you have an intent, you search for that, you go online, you purchase that and you're done, right? But normal human beings do not shop like that. A, a trip to the shopping mall is an experience. And I think extended reality can help along with social commerce or social media to bring this experience to life. So that's, I, I think, something that I'm very bullish about uh, as well. And the third component, which I think would be uh, would be pretty important and interesting as well, uh, I, I I I feel that uh, from a mobile first life, we may actually move to a mobile only life in our daily life. Yeah. Right. So I I see about eighty five percent plus of all the online sales happening through mobile devices in the next two to three years. They're making it so easy with all the apps. I mean, we've got, you mentioned Amazon, we've got the Amazon app, you know, you need, we got Alexa. You want to talk about, you know, exactly. social commerce or, uh, uh, you know, social commerce is, exactly. as an example, you know, I mean, they've got smart refrigerators now. Exactly. You know, if, if, if the area where the milk goes is light, right. Milk shows up the next day on your doorstep. Exactly. That's incredible. I mean, like it's coming. What, um, so are you working on any other projects? Yeah, we are. Uh, we have set up a reality lab last year, and we are working with a gentleman who used to be a product director at Tencent in China. So he's wow. sort of advising us there. So I think that's pretty. Uh, and we are making some substantial progress there. We have a product innovation lab, Justin, where we have actually made some huge progress uh, uh, to helping our clients succeed in the in the first party cookie world. As you know, that third party cookies are deprecating and. So we, we have built this platform for Alexa Insights, which we have really now tried to uh, infuse a lot more of the AI component. It, the, the platform was built almost about four or five years back and it is pro progressing. So now we are able to literally predict, for example, if your customer, if you, the, the, what is the probability of the first time purchaser to buy again from you in the next 30 days, 45 days and so on. And AI is really helping us do this extremely well. Wow. We are able to predict the lifetime value of a customer based on the first purchase behavior and the different channel touch points. Again, AI is able to help us do that. So AI and the extended reality are the two. And the third part is more of a, an initiative uh, that we are, I think the European market is interesting. So we are trying to get a foothold in the Nordics market and also the Middle East as well. So just trying to sort of just get in. And uh, probably, probably the venture that I am most passionate about, and I think you sort of know the story, Justin, so we, we started a, a, a non-profit uh, about five years back called the Udan Foundation of the Flight Foundation, uh, where we support the education of high school uh, underprivileged girls in India and sponsor their high school and college education. So about six to seven years of education is sponsored entirely by us. And these girls, uh, essentially, just to give you an understanding, uh, they mostly live in the slums and uh, their parents have no means for them to uh, really pursue education beyond the 10th grade, uh, which is subsidized by the government till the 10th grade. As a result of which, a lot of the girls are dropping out after the 10th grade exam. And unfortunately, they don't have too much of an option but to get married. So uh, what we are trying to do is through the path of education, 
trying to combat this absolute terrible evil of uh, child marriage. So yeah. where girls of the age of 13 and 14 are getting married away. So we currently are sponsoring about 12 girls and uh, they are doing exceptionally well, extremely proud of that. So that probably that's is the most great. important part that we are working on. Yeah. Wow, that's amazing. That That is, uh, that's amazing. Um, is your wife spearheading that or? Uh, uh, both of us do. Both of us do. And our India team members do a tremendous amount of work all voluntarily. Yeah. You are a, uh, a wealth of, of, of knowledge, of ideas, of passion. What advice could you give to our listeners? Work, life, entrepreneurship, you name it. Wow, that's a, that's a pretty big question. I, I think uh, life effectively, I think that the, I, I started the life part. Uh, my, my simple advice would be, uh, I, I know many of your listeners may be very hard charged professionals, etc. I think it's extremely important for you to take a pause and just smell the flowers. It's as simple as that, right? Sometimes we just sort of keep running and then, oh gosh, what did I miss? Suddenly my kids grew up and I never really enjoyed anything with them, right? So let us just sort of take a pause, understand, take a stock and smell the flowers. That's pretty, pretty I mean, that's, that's, I think you don't have to rush, uh, uh, constantly keep rushing because it's not sustainable. You will get burnt out, it's a guarantee. And then have a, have a, a in terms of the career part, have a growth mindset. I mean, unless and until you have this growth mindset and open to the possibilities, you are blocking off yourself and all that you have potential for. Everyone has tremendous potential, tremendous potential. The problem is their mind. Their mind blocks off 80% of the people from realizing the potential. <laughs> so my request is please do not let your mind be that tremendous block because you will always regret the things that you have not done just because your mind blocked it off. So be true to your potential and realize the potential. And it's a lot more than what you think. In terms of entrepreneurship, I think uh, failing faster is a good thing. And honestly speaking, I mean, you really have to have not only a thick skin, but you really have to really just sort of every time you fall down and I, we have probably heard of falling down innumerable number of times, you just have to get up, brush, and sort of move forward because that's what entrepreneurship is all about. It's not about that one time big success, suddenly you make a Google. How many Googles are there in the world? How many Facebooks are there in the world? But I think entrepreneurship is about, a, it's basically a slow, steady process whereby you are always, always cognizant of the fact that you are moving forward and you are doing a little better today compared to what you are doing yesterday. And you are charged and enthused to do better tomorrow compared to what you will be doing today. Wow. So that's, I think, what entrepreneurship is about, yeah. Now you're a great dad. You're a husband. What about life? What about family? Family. Uh, I have two kids. Uh, my my son is now going to be going to college. What? And, uh, oh it's God. yeah, time flies, Justin. And wow. uh, my my daughter is uh, going to turn twelve uh, in about five months, four 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 months. And uh, my wife and I uh, we have been happily married for about twenty one years now, and uh, we have been partners in. Crime, as we say, crime is basically, <laughs> I think, both in life as well as work. And it's really a, a joy, joy every day to have them around around me uh, as we really have to take this interesting journey together. Yeah. Great. So, Do you know where your son's yeah. going to school? Yeah. Uh, he currently has gotten into the, the honors program at Kelly Business School in Indiana. So that's what he is headed to. Yeah. Wow. Great. Congrats. Thank you. Um, if you were in my shoes, uh, we're getting close to the end here and I really appreciate your time uh, uh, and the value you're bringing. If you were in my shoes, is there anything that I should have asked you but didn't? Great question. You may have asked me more about my failures, right? Normally, I think in all such talks, people talk about successes, but every success, there's probably about 20 failures behind every success. Yeah. And while success obviously is infectious, I think it's important to share about the failures as well. For example, I mean, one thing which I can very openly talk about, Justin, is, I mean, uh, you should know that on April 30th, 2005, we had $5 in our bank, $5. We were still in India, and we had decided to uh, close down Netflix because $5, I can assure you, nowhere in the world, you can really run a company. And we had decided to sort of pack up. And uh, we never stopped believing in Netflix and what we could do. It's just that we didn't have any money, right? So that was, that was, I think, one of the worst days of my life because we had just about three team members and I had to, I couldn't, I, I had to let them go because I couldn't afford them, right? And that's where I think after the failure, what happened was something which is really, really brilliant and beautiful. 
and I don't know, it probably is, I would call it a miracle. That's the reason we are around. Uh, on the 2nd of May, and this was uh, one day before our India phone number was supposed to be disconnected, I get a call from this gen gentleman called Jay Stainfield. I had never met him, never heard of him and so on. He says that I am the CEO of a company called blinds.com and you have been referred by one person who speaks extremely high up, high up you. I believe you have sort of filed for some international patent and all that stuff. Would you be willing to do a paid search test for me? Just a three month test to prove as to how good your system is. I'll not be able to pay you much. I'll pay you $5,000 a month. So I said, is it even real? Is it even happening? $5 in the bank, someone is offering you $15,000 for three months. You just, just shut up and take it. Right. And at the end of it, I think uh, we did extremely well. We sort of grew their account by about 40%. Jay invited me. And Jay now is, has become almost like that mentor and the guide and so on. Uh, Jay Stenfield's actually book is also coming out uh, shortly. Uh, he sold his company, uh, blinds.com, just blinds to Home Depot about four or five years back. Okay. And he's one of those people without who we wouldn't really have been here today. So I am wow. forever grateful. This was the day before the phone was getting turned off? This was about yeah, 16 hours before the phone probably would have been turned off. Yeah. So never stop believing. That's my big yeah, thing. Man. And it was a disaster. It was a tremendous failure primarily because we had to let go of people and we were sort of decided how to fail. So after every failure, can you really truly, truly gauge as to how sweet success really yeah. is? Smells? That's amazing. That is, that really is. Well, you know, I really want to thank you again. How can how can our listeners connect with you? How what's the best way to connect with you, Uday? Uh, uh, I, you, you can connect with me on LinkedIn, uh, Justin, okay. today and, both, and I'm extremely passionate about helping people, whatever it is, any questions, yes, happy to help them, yeah. or they can email me my first name, Udayan, U-D-A-Y-A-N at netelixir.com. I am, okay. I'm probably one of the most accessible, uh, chief entertainment officers that you would ever see. <laughs> chief entertainment. If I, uh, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll put the links to both your, uh, sure. your Absolutely. LinkedIn, as well as your email in the, uh, yes. in the, in the in the content part of the, the podcast. This yeah. has been great. I really appreciate it. Oh, thank you very much, Justin. It's absolutely a privilege. Absolutely a privilege. Yeah, I, I'm sorry uh, if I've been a little too blunt and direct, but it's straight from the heart. As you know, with me, it's always from the heart. So. Absolutely. Absolutely is. Um, well, once again, thanks so much for coming on and uh, we'll, we'll do this again sometime soon. Absolutely. Thank you, my friend. Take All care. Right. Have a great weekend. Thank you.